right, well, welcome to Tim's Take today, and we're probably talking about one of the most important subjects that you can talk about is marketing your grains. And we're here with Dr. Ben Brown. He's our state extension specialist in ag econ and markets, and particularly the grain markets. That's and right. I've heard so many people today, we're here on September 17th, corn starting to come out, or we're getting really close to it, say, boy, our corn is great, I just wish the price was better. It is. That's what I'm hearing too. All across the state, people are excited about yields, um, but concerned about prices and profitability. Um, but certainly the yields are coming off very strong for Missouri. And, and certainly after the last two years, I think that's welcomed. It is. But uh, at, I, I just looked today, just before we came on air, corn's about 340 ish right now. Cash markets here in central Missouri. Soybeans are. 950, 960. You know, at one time, those sounded pretty good. Sure. It wasn't that long ago either that we were pretty excited about those prices, right? Like mm -hmm. we used to talk about $4 corn being uh, a good target, a good profitability point. Right. Uh, given where input costs have gone the last, let's just say, five years, uh, Four dollars doesn't cut it anymore for most operations, unfortunately, on the corn side. And and frankly, you know, ten dollar soybeans don't necessarily cut it on the soybean side either. There are some exceptions to that that comment, but uh, our cost structure has increased so much that we have to reset our expectations about what a good price is for our product. And, and this our our uh, FSA have, have they set the floor a little higher, or is it still at two dollars on corn and? Yeah, so we have both the marketing loans that have been around since the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, there are proposals to increase those marketing loan rates and even the the ARC County price reference. And Well, so the PLC, the price loss coverage, and the ARC County, you know, those reference prices have also been proposed to be increased in, in different versions of a new farm bill, but uh, we don't have a new farm bill yet. And so we're not sure where those are going to go and, and how to pay for those. But, but certainly, yes, the marketing loan prices are still roughly the same as what they've been the last couple of years. Mm. And with our crop insurance, we, the farmers can buy revenue protection too. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and it's become the dominant form, at least for corn and soybean and wheat producers in the state of Missouri. Uh, there are, you know, you get down in the boot hill, there are producers that use yield insurance policies for cotton, rice, peanuts, things like that. But uh, certainly, you know, revenue policies and have been something that has really grown in popularity across the Midwest and especially here in Missouri as well. So it's not just yield, it's revenue. Yeah, it's it's price times quantity. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the nice part about revenue insurance products is uh, you get both a springtime planting price that sets the floor, and then you get a harvest price set in October that kind of sets the difference. And so even if you have average yields and the price falls enough between February and October, you know, that can trigger a, a crop insurance claim as well. Um, and so if we look at where we're at this year, not only do we see you know some areas that maybe are looking at average to a slightly above average deals, um, but their revenue could be down year over year based on how far prices have fallen compared to last year. And the farmer will get the difference? or Yeah, so it's set based on a benchmark in February. And then for corn and soybeans, that harvest price is set in October um, based on the November soybean co crop for contract for soybeans and the December contract for corn. And if that falls below a, a guaranteed percentile, right? So each producer gets to elect what percentage of their revenue they want to insure. Uh, the higher that percentage is set, the higher their guarantee is, and therefore the easier it is to trigger. That costs you know, more. It does cost <laughs> more. You are correct. It does <laughs> cost more. And so, you know, but it does trigger a little bit more frequently uh, than if you're setting down at 60% coverage. And, and that's what we, you all are really uh, promoting somewhat is more, um, having a consistency that you know your expenses, you know what you got to have and, and through uh, insurance and other means you can, you can work with that. Yeah. Well, so risk is risk. Yes. Yeah. Risk is an interesting thing. It's what I love to talk about. It's what I spend most of my time doing. And, and in some ways risk is not what we 
think it is, right? So I, you talk to producers and they describe the risk that faces their operation and what they're really talking about is uncertainty. Mm. Um, the way I define risk and the way we t- typically think about risk is we know our expected payoffs and we know the uh, the probability of hitting certain certain either prices or yields. So let's, let's take both of those comments or both of those components uh, and, and talk about them. So most producers treat those as uncertainty, or excuse me, as risk, and they're really uncertainty. And the reason that we can, we can kind of evaluate that is we have crop insurance records. We know what our yields are, and, and we can kind of divide that up and say, well, what's over the past 15, 10 years, you know, what's the probability that my yield falls below this certain point, right? And we can, we can look at, you know, that percentile of a, an outcome. Same thing on the price side. We can kind of look at a distribution of prices based on a number of ways. Uh, one of the common ways is to use futures and options markets to look at, you know, what the market is bidding for the likelihood that prices rise or fall below certain points as well. And so we can take those and we can bring those together and we can, we can, we can say, okay, there's a 40% chance that our revenue falls below this benchmark. Is that is that something I'm willing to tolerate? Um, and if I'm not willing to tolerate that, what type of risk management tools, crop insurance, marketing, maybe ARC and PLC programs through the Farm Service Agency, you know, those are the tools that then we can apply for any of those distributions below a threshold of which we can't tolerate that, that uncertainty. And probably with the prices right now here in mid-September, we're probably below that uncertainty below those targets for most folks. Yes, um, and I it's it depends on the operation, which is the the economic answer for everything. It always depends, but we built sizable working capital positions across the ag sector the last couple of years, and that has been uh, in some ways a a very um, unique way of managing operation because we didn't have to worry about the the financial risk as much as what we do when prices are are low and and times are lean. We're now entering into this period that looks very similar, at least in my opinion, to the 15 through 2019 period, right? That, That era there where we continuously saw prices at or below break-even levels, where we saw yields strong, but not enough necessarily to, to continue to build a cushion. And we bur- burnt through some equity. And and then we, from from 2019 really through 2023, and you could argue 22, uh, we built sizable working capital positions that now we're kind of unwinding again. So um, this all goes in cycles, uh, and, and certainly the financial working capital uh, has been something that has allowed us to continue to operate and not really have to have the hard, crucial conversations within farming operations. So what caused that at 2019 things started to change? Yeah, so it was met by a couple of things. One, we saw a strong increase in prices really starting in 2020 after the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we saw you know commodity prices rise um, pretty substantially. Then that was followed by uh, you know a conflict in the Black Sea region of Russia invading Ukraine, and that that pushed commodity prices even higher. And we had multiple years uh, during that period of of below trend production on the global market. And so, you know, it's not just a drought here in the United States or a drought in South America, but we had, in some ways, we had droughts in back-to-back seasons, uh, a drought here in the United States followed by a drought in South America. Uh, we had a number of things during that period that were rather unique. Um, and and I, I know I'm probably bringing some heartburn to some listeners out there, but if you think about it, right, we had not only a severe drought in Iowa, but we had a derecho in Iowa during that yes. period of time. We had prevent plant in 2019 like we hadn't seen in a long, long time in places like North Dakota, Northwest Ohio. Um, and, and so really it was a production-driven market um, that then was followed by – like I said, COVID-19 and some of the shortages we had there, and then also followed by um, the outbreak in, in the Black Sea or the mm-hmm. you know the conflict that we see there. And so that really drove these markets higher. Uh, that was also at the same time when we saw large amounts of government payments for a number of different things. In 2019 and 2020, it was trade assistance payments to help alleviate the damage of of the, uh, the retaliatory tariffs by the Chinese. Uh, in 2020, 
20, 21, and kind of somewhat of 22, we saw large uh, coronavirus assistance payments to, to producers. And then we started to get into the disaster programs for some of the things I mentioned a while ago. So all that tied together led to historically strong farm income levels. And 2022 was the highest farm income level uh, we'd ever seen. And now we've seen our production go up the last few years, even though Missouri, we were, we had some drought issues, but on a nationwide and worldwide, they didn't. Yeah, absolutely. So I like to remind my colleagues in other states that, uh, you know, the last two years weren't all that rosy for Missouri. So we deserve a year like this <laughs> uh, to where, you know, yields are relatively strong. And, um, you know, the, the challenge is, is yields are good in Missouri, but they're very good and you know, strong in, in states like Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa as well. And so that's, you know, we're seeing this rebound in production. We're looking at a very large South American soybean crop coming online as well. And the expectations of that uh, are, you know, that the global soybean picture grows uh, to a point where our stocks to use in global soybeans is as a, at an all-time record as well. So lots of soybeans on the global market that we'll have to work through before we can see any type of price rally in soybeans. And and because you, you mentioned global, if China buys soybeans from us or Brazil, it's still... There's just a lot of soybeans out yeah, there. It's, it's, it's still... <laughs> yeah, up. there's a lot of soybeans. Uh, you know, right now we're looking at a high 160 million metric tons, so 160 plus million metric tons of soybeans coming out of Brazil. Um, it wasn't that long ago that we were talking about 130, 120 mm -hmm. soybean production quantities coming out of Brazil. So they've really ramped up production uh, in the last four to five years to levels that, you know, seem almost impossible but that's what they've been doing and they're ahead of us now aren't they yes they they produce more soybeans and export more soybeans in the united states how about corn well so we had the one year there where they did produce more or excuse me export more corn than than us uh, two years ago but uh, we've regained that and my expectation is that we'll hold that market share for at least the rest of the you know at least the next few years okay yeah all right because i i know one time when we were number one on soybeans and Brazil and the Argentina together were number two, the economist said, we don't want to be number two. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly, it's been a change of a market. Um, mm -hmm. I think Brazil's second crop corn has had a bigger impact um, for our farm management decisions here in the United States than than really the growth of their South American corn or soybean crop. And, and I'll break that down and talk about it. Um, they're, Growth, and especially that second season or the Safrinia corn crop, has really pushed our marketing window um, a little bit earlier. Uh, we used to talk about, you know, April, May being really good times to market. I would say February and March ahead of, you know, their crop production or their crop harvest is becoming a, a a little bit more of a ideal timeline for marketing corn. Their soybean crop is just mammoth and continues to grow. Um, it, it, it continues to, to increase every year. We continue to see more soybeans, not out of Brazil, but also Argentina. And to your point earlier, you know, even if China's not buying from us and they're buying all the beans they can get from, from Brazil and Argentina, there's still a lot of soybeans out there. And is there still the GMO factor or do countries worry about that in, anymore? It shows up in different places um, from time to time. So the one here recently was the GMO corn dispute with Mexico. Uh, the, the previous political administration in Mexico announced that they were going to move away from GMO corn imports. Namely, you know, that impacts us. We have about 90% of the, the market share in the Chinese uh, market. Uh, almost all of that, not all, but almost all of it is yellow number two corn that is GMO based. We we do send them a lot of white corn and we do send them a lot of GMO free corn. So I don't want that to get lost in this, but a lot of what we were sending them was GMO yellow corn, number two corn. And, and so that had a big impact, at least in the market. However, it kind of worked its way through some of the different, you know, panel resolution disputes and, and the new administration has announced that they're going to drop that, that restriction. Um, and so that's, that's good for, for U S corn producers. I still think that U S agriculture needs to see that case go all the way through the court system, or at least the resolution system. That way we have something to show that 
hey, this is this is what the court would would rule if it was brought be brought forward. So okay, so here we are, mid September, corn's coming out, soybeans are on the verge of coming out. What do you do? <laughs> do you sell right now? I mean, yeah. is there anything that's going to push those prices up in in in, in, in the winter or, or, or the early spring. Yeah. So I, um, you know, this is always a hard emotional decision for, for producers. I try to break it down into like a flow chart looking at, you know, really the two components of markets, both the futures market and then also the, the basis market, which is driven by cash. You had mentioned about uh, corn prices in central Missouri being, you know, in the low three, 330 range. Mm-hmm. Um, it should be noted that futures markets have actually been relatively stable here the last couple of months trading right around four dollars where we've seen all the deterioration in that cash market has been the basis market um, and so I that's just my one example um, I could give many but that's my one example of the importance of managing futures prices separate from basis prices um, so the question of what do we do right so there is carry in this market we didn't have carry a couple of years ago because the market was incentivizing pr- producers to bring the grain to market mm-hmm. today. Um, and so there wasn't an incentive to store. Today, there is a positive carry in that market. There would be an incentive to store the product. Um, the second part of this is related to basis. Basis values are, are weak across the state. Uh, we've, we've seen pretty pretty weak basis levels and weakening as this crop comes out. And we, see, so this, and we see the size of it. And we'll talk about storage capacity here in just a second. But you know, basis is, is something that has been really weak. And I think it could even weaken further because not only do we have a strong corn crop, there's going to be at least somewhat of a, of a soybean crop. We could argue about the size of the soybean. But then also our river water levels are deteriorating. We're seeing lower and lower river water levels. That's making it harder for us to move product to export facilities. That's going to have an impact um, and push down basis as we move forward. So you combine all that and the market would say, yes, you could either store and go ahead and hedge that grain for delivery in March. That's a period. That's a that's a possibility. But at these low futures prices, you know, there's also you know, the at least somewhat of an incentive and a historical justification for storing unpriced grain and waiting for any type of hope and market rally uh, in the months ahead. So that's one of the challenges we have is there's not a lot of great options, but, uh, you know, selling across the scales right now is is kind of de-incentivized. You are selling low right now because of the weak basis is, basis you are selling pretty low yeah no 330 is a low price right so like i it's hard for me to tell producers to sell across the scales today when the market is incentivizing at least some carry um to to hold until march or may uh you know you could capture some carry through that that Mm -hmm. period of time hope for basis improvements maybe we get into march and and we see a little bit better basis than what we do today um so certainly i do think that there is you know, the incentive to at least wait, right? Or at least put some risk protection by selling the carry and going ahead and storing and then protecting that with a a stored hedge or something. But, um, you know, the basis market is the one that maybe concerns me a little bit because it could get worse here in the next couple of weeks before hopefully rebounding in the spring. Okay. And soybeans... About the same story then, <laughs> weak bases. Uh, there's a lot of soybeans out there. It's just so much. Yeah, it's hard. So the thing that concerns me about soybeans is I don't see the opportunity to recapture some of these storage costs, right? Mm-hmm. And this is always the challenge of like, if you're going to store, make sure you have an exit plan in place to be able to get out if if things aren't improving or if the outlook, the picture doesn't change. and. That's one of the concerns I I see on soybeans right now is like it is hard for me to see any type of futures market rally. Um, And then on top of that, on the basis, uh, we could can, you know, we might see a little bit better basis here in the short run. uh, But some of the same problems exist for soybeans that we see in the corn with the river level. Plus Mm -hmm. also, you know, the the chance of retaliatory tariffs by China in, in the weeks and months ahead. And China's big market is is our soybeans. They buy a lot of soybeans from us. They buy a right. lot of soybeans from the world. They buy a lot of soybeans. You know, as a state, 
as a whole, across all of our commodities, uh, you could argue that China is more important to the cotton market, oh. um, the soybean market, just be based on how much they buy of cotton um, relative to what we produce. But from a physical value standpoint, and then also a you know quantity standpoint, uh, they buy a, a a lot of soybeans from the United States. The internal use, though, um, it seems like our herd is still growing. Our cattle herd. Because because the price of cattle is, are so high. Well, I would like to say that Tim. I uh, I would like to say that our cattle herd's growing. It's hard to know exactly what is happening uh, with the cattle herd. In the last couple of years, the market incentives have suggested to grow the cattle herd, but we've had drought two years of mm -hmm. drought, and so forage availability has been rather you know short. Um, and, and we did not see the herd grow the last two years when we maybe would have anticipated mm -hmm. a little bit of growth. I would argue that I don't think we're at the bottom of the, the supply side of cattle yet. Um, no. When we start to turn that corner and we start to see less heifers on feed as a share of, of all cattle, when we start to see less call cows enter into slaughter facilities, you know, that's going to tighten that beef supply even further and we're going to see prices spike higher. Um, I don't think we've seen that yet. Uh, certainly, I do think there are areas where, where cattle producers are starting to retain heifers and grow their operation. But broadly speaking, um, I don't think we've turned the corner yet. So at some point, to your point, at some point down the road, we're going to have more cattle to feed. We could say that about all of our animal units, right? So I think of pork, profitability in pork the last couple of years has been very low. 2023 was, in some measures, the worst profitability year for pork producers we've ever seen. Ever. Ever. I mean, we had some terrible years. Yeah, yeah. So even worse than 1998, right? That's right. a year that commonly gets thrown out in the pork industry. And, and 2023 was a, a rough year. Um, low pork prices and high feed costs really put a squeeze on pork producers. A lot of red ink in, in the pork budgets. Um, so 2024 is going to be a little bit better, uh, thanks mostly to lower feed costs. Uh, maybe we start to see pork producers start to expand in the right. next couple of years. But similar to cattle to where we've got this one limitation that's kind of keeping people from just robustly starting to expand, I would argue that the pork prices aren't as high as where we'd like to see them to really start to get excited about pork expansion. And then the final one is on the poultry side, um, avian flu mm -hmm. or you know, the has, has really decimated our poultry flocks across the country. Not only that, um, in, in the southeast part of the United States, Georgia, North Carolina, this year was a very poor corn crop for them. Um, they're going to have very high feed costs. And so, again, you know, the incentive is there that we have lower production of poultry, um, higher prices, but feed cost in that specific general area, ge geographical area of the country is going to pre prevent rapid growth in the poultry herd. Because I know my uh, my wife was talking just the other day about the price of eggs. Yes, yes. It's, that's such a stable, you know, how do families make it on $5 a dozen eggs? Yeah. It's funny. I think we all, I think eggs seem to be the one that we all like gravitate to, right? Like that right. was the, that was the first thing during COVID that I really started to notice prices start to rally um, here in the last, you know, two years, right? I could almost tell if we had an avian flu outbreak in Missouri based on going to the grocery store and buying eggs. Um, and so certainly it is, it's almost like gas prices. I once heard that gas prices are so important to the U.S. economy that we literally blow them up big enough to where you can see them driving 70 miles an hour down the road. I would argue that egg prices are almost as important in terms of the psychological mentality of consumers across the country. Hey, I drove an extra 20 miles to save eight cents on, ga on gas the other day. There you go. <laughs> I mean, probably didn't pay off. But, I was going to say, we could calculate and see if this worked or not. But the but, psychological thing. Yes, yes. You paid eight che cents cheaper. That's right. Right, that's right. So really, we don't have that domestic demand that's, that that can help us out on the on the commodity grains. So I wouldn't. Livestock. Yeah. So I wouldn't. So if we just talk about livestock at the current point, I think we are towards the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. Like the beef herd is shrinking. Um, the poultry herd is has been faced with outbreak, and then the pork industry has just been faced with low profitability. So all three are at a low point in, in terms of total grain consuming animal right. units. I could sit here and say, I can see a scenario where all three of those start growing in the year ahead. And then two, three years down the, down the road from now, we see, and it might even have to be that long, one or two years down the road, we start to see more grain consumed by these grain consuming animal units, right? So domestically, that is a, 
that is something where I look and I can be relatively optimistic about the trend. Um, biofuels is another area mm-hmm. where domestic demand, I think, shows some some robust optimism as we look ahead as well. Right, because cheaper corn, you could increase the ethanol production. But other than that, there's not a lot that's going to push our prices in the, in the near future. At least under current yes. policies, right? right. And, and, and that's an important caveat, I think, in this. There are policies for biofuels, both on the soybean side for vegetable oils and soybean oil, and on the ethanol side uh, for corn, that could create opportunities for a little bit higher of prices. But... Again, based on where we are today and and not assuming policy moving forward, you know, it's not, you know, it's going to be relatively stable. It's not going to be the drastic demand driver that we, you know, producers are hoping for. Um, so what does that leave? And, and we spent a lot of time already talking about this. You know, that leaves that the demand driver for higher prices is going to have to come in the export market. And I think we can see higher exports in the corn market. I'm a little concerned on the soybean side just based on how many soybeans we have in the global market. <laughs>